it's us. We're back. Yeah. We will be reading. Uh, let's let's triple check. I already forgot. Chapter four. <laughs> yes, okay. chapter four and five for the RSC thirty twenty story written by Mr. Geo, also known as George Edinbaum. And as you can see, we are here. We are ready to camp out. And let's go ahead and put another log on the fire. Yeah. Let's put another one. This is yeah. chapter four, the war we can't win. So you guys know. Yep. All right. Whenever you're ready. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> As the air cleared around the precinct, some sounds of coffee came from the inside of the. <laughs> it was Daryl. He stood up from the ruins, covered in dust. A few feet away, he saw the body of an officer who had thrown the flash grenade laying among what had been the wall. His eyes gazed over like a doll in a death stare. His left arm was missing, and there was a gaping hole in his right side of his chest. Rib bones were sticking out of the hole in the armored vest he had been wearing which had not done him in him a damn bit of good. Daryl stood there a long moment, just looking down at the lifeless body, trying to recall the man's name. He couldn't. He thought it was Carl. He looked around him. Still a daze. It was all quiet. He could not believe his eyes. One Centino had fully leveled down the whole precinct. If that was the case, the world was in trouble. Mason! Captain! There was no response. Save the echo of uh, his voice. Mason. He looked around the lifeless bodies of all the men. The smell of blood mixed with the rancid, uh, acerid smell of smoke from the fires filled the air. He walked around the ruins until he found Captain Higgins. Bleeding and struggling to stay alive. Captain, don't move. Don't try to say a thing. Captain Higgins managed to smile and beckoned him to draw closer. You guys, be careful. This is war we may never win now. Stay safe, Daryl. With that, the captain breathed his last breath. Daryl closed his eyes in pain as he held onto the body of the respectable Captain Higgins. A man from whom he had learned a lot. Some of the other men who survived began to stand up. Mason was still alive. He had six other men, plus Daryl. That was seven in total out of the precinct. Most was almost 50 men. All stood there in a shock and sorrow over the loss of their captain and all the other officers. Daryl stood up and walked towards Mason and the others. Thank fucking heavens you are alive said Mason to Daryl. Hey, yeah, thanks for pulling me back like that. Daryl just nodded his head as he put his hand on his friend's shoulder. We have to move now. Everyone go and check on your families. Be very careful, men. Please arm yourselves the best way that you can, and good luck. With that, the men, all the men left the precinct and headed towards their homes. Daryl and Mason moved in the same direction, all the cars in the precinct had been destroyed, including his big, ugly, rolling rust bucket of a truck. Well, Sam may just be thankful for that, whispered Daryl. As they moved on foot, they tried calling their home, but it seemed all communication lines were down. They hopped for the best as they continued on moving through a destroyed landscape left behind by the robots' attacks. Burning cars were everywhere. Destroyed buildings. Bodies really with bullies, bullets on, are torn apart and laying there. And there, and sometimes it was an entire body. Just part of one, such as a leg or hand. And at one point, they came across just half of some woman's face lying on the street. Where the hell is the rest of her? Mason <laughs> wondered as he stood there looking down at the half uh, of face lying on the pavement and just just that one pale blue eye looking up at them as if 
accusing them of doing something. Del didn't answer. <sighs> Just sighed as he looked across the street at the smoldering remains of the deli and just shook his head. Mm -mm -mm. They moved on from there. The fear and uncertainty of showing on their faces as they turned and froze at every strange sound, worried that another one of those killer bots was stalking. Soon, the two men had, parted, had to part ways. You stood put, Mason. Just get Maggie and wait for us. And please, do stay safe. Said Daryl oh. as he and Mason parted ways. Daryl ran all the way towards his house, hoping to find his wife and daughter alive. As they turned onto his street, he could tell that the Sentinels had been there. Houses and cars were still ablaze. Oily black clouds of smoke billowing into the sky. The obvious signs of a recent attack. He ran on towards his house and was shocked to see it was on all, still in one piece. All the other houses were around there were either smoldering ruins or partially standing, yet burning. Only his house was standing intact. He rushed through the black door and ran to the bathroom where they found the hidden door to a small room beneath. In there was his wife and daughter, crying and sweating. <laughs> sweating. There was so much relief in his heart when he saw them. He helped them out of the bunker and hugged them tightly. He had pre-installed it because times like this. It was obviously because of the inactivity within the house that it was left standing. The worst has happened. Those tank tanks have gone devilish, destroying everything they come across. The precinct was blown up by a sentinel. What about Uncle Mason? Cut in Nadia. He's fine, replied Daryl, and he he's gone to check on Aunt Maggie. But we need to be fast. Get whatever little things you can pack. We leave in five. With that, Sam and Nadia headed up to the stairs and packed a few things while Daryl stood watch. He got thinking for a minute. He didn't really know where they could go that would be safe. But he knew that he had to move his family out of there as soon as possible. Nadia was the first to get down. She had changed into some dim colored clothing that was difficult to detect in dark. Daryl looked up, looked at her and smiled. Camp emergency procedures, right? <laughs> Nadia nodded. Daryl looked at her. She was a pretty smart kid. I'm, I'm scared, Dad, as said Nadia, as she ran towards her dad and hugged him tight. Don't worry, sweetheart. Daddy's here, said Daryl. He had never really seen Nadia scared before, and now that he saw it, he didn't like it. He held her close and tried to calm her nerves. Sam came down, carrying a little bag for herself and Daryl. They moved out through the back door, staying in the darkest darkness as much as possible. As they got close to the Mason's house, they could tell they can see the whole street was already ravaged. They moved faster towards Mason's house. As they got there, the sight they saw made them stop. Mason was on the floor with Maggie in his arms, dead. He was sobbing uncontrollably, <laughs> like a little child. <laughs> Maggie was all he had in the world. There was nothing anyone could say. They all sat down on the floor besides Mason. Sam and Nadia had joined them in the mor on, in, on the morning. Soon, Daryl heard some robots coming in the distance. He used his binoculars and discovered it was the highest rate of the robots, Titan. These ones were built to be indestructible. Okay, it's time to move, said Daryl. Mason was still on the floor holding on to Maggie's body. Come on, man, stand up, screamed Daryl. Still, there was no movement. Nadia ran to him and hugged him and tucked at his arm. Uncle Mason, Nadia's little voice seemed to bring him back to life. He looked into her pristine eyes and he stood up picked her up and headed towards the woods behind the house. Daryl and Sam followed behind him, barely escaping the light of the Titans. Hours later, they found a cave, which was to be their haven for the time being. They were safer now from all the dangers and robots. That was what mattered most. Chapter 5, The Resistance 
It had been two months since the GDI turned against the whole world. Since then, Beryl, Sam, Nadia, and Mason have been living in a little cave up in the mountain. Every morning, Daryl and Mason went out to get whatever food they could find. They mostly hunted, but occasionally took a risky trip into town to get some food and other supplies. Going to town was risky business. The, the once vibrant town had been ruined by the GDI invasion. The few people that were left were either the FEMA camp set up, or Richmond Elementary, or hiding away in their home. Daryl and Mason refused to go to the FEMA camps. Once you get in, you can't get out. Mm -hmm. they, they instead stayed in contact with the people that hid in their homes, or went to abandoned shopping malls and stores to get whatever they needed. Every single trip to town was a very careful one. You did not want to be found at the GTI or by patrolling officers soldiers. <laughs> one meant death, and the other would mean you were locked up in the FEMA camp. One, no, on one such day, when they went out into town to get supplies, some serious chaos raged when an army patrol got into a firefight with a few centiles. They had an ambush of a few centiles and some of the smaller guardians hiding in the rubble of the short buildings and demolished cars, waiting until the bots got to, to just about in the middle of the street, and then an RPG fired by a soldier shot from one and the burnt remains of a car and hit one by one of the sentinels dead in center of its waist, blowing it in half. <laughs> Even as the robot fell in half, it fired a, off a grenade from its wrist launcher. And the round shot straight into the air and landed right between the two smaller guardians. Promptly exploding and damaging them badly. Then all hell broke loose. The army had robots open fire on each other with automatic weapons and explosive projectiles. Some of the soldiers must have had armor piercing rounds of some, of some type as their bullets tore into the guardian sentinels. And one of the remaining... Guardians apart. At the same time, several soldiers were hit with automatic fire and fell bleeding or dead. Just when it appeared to Daryl and Mason, who were crouched down behind the wall of bricks and rubble. Watching that, the armor, army met, might lose the rumbling sound <laughs> came from behind <laughs> them. <laughs> and huge <laughs> M.I. and Bram's tank came rolling around the corner. And even before it had stopped, the two turret turned and fired at the sentinel. Whatever round they had fired was serious, and it blew one of the sentinels apart. Another turned on the tank and fired off an explosive round, which hit the roll before the tank, knocking it off the shred. Yet the tank's machine guns opened fire, and of course, the remaining robots returned fired. The air was filled with sounds, whistling bullets, smoke and skipping tracer sounds. One of the sentinels leaped into the air using its stack back, landing on top of the tank and began firing its armor-piercing rounds through the top of the turret, killing everyone inside. While Daryl and Mason were trying to avoid the crossfire, they ran into some men who were scavenging for food also. The men saw them at first and beckoned on them to come. Daryl and Mason went across the road to, to them in the shopping mall opposite of the road. Hey, I'm Daryl, and this is my friend Mason. Daryl extended a handshake to the eldest of the men. My name is my Michael. My name is Michael, <laughs> and these are my boys. Yeah. All the men are strange pleasantry. One look at all the men, and Daryl could observe that they were armed to the teeth. With each one had a rifle slung around its shoulder, a pistol in the waist, Plus knives kept in their boots. We came to gather some whatever little spots we could find, said Michael. You don't look like you're from the camps. Are you new around here? No, replied Daryl. We lived in this town all our lives, until the GDI ransacked it about two months ago. Since then, we've been here and there in the woods, occasionally coming to town to get some of the supplies. You don't look too familiar either, said Daryl. Being a police officer in time, 
it was his duty to know almost everybody that lived there. A new face wasn't too difficult for him to spot, and these new faces were clearly new. We're from the bigger cities, said Michael. The cities have fallen, and that uh, is left to those metal demons scanning for anything that lives or breathes. Uh, what cities? asked Daryl. This is this was serious news for him, having been cut off from the rest of the world for the past two months. Most of the local uh, local cable channels have been gone silent. A few days after the attacks, he really needed the update. All of them, son, said Michael, looking down remorsefully. San Francisco, New York, Chicago, you name it. All those cities are now nothing but ghost towns. The people who live there are either dead or have moved to small cities to wait their death. These things are all going to come this way soon and everything on their path will be wiped out. This has become the fate of the world. You either die where you are or you move away to die another day. Daryl and Mason had, was shocked <gasps> to discover that all the big cities have been taken over in such a short time. What about the FEMA camps? asked Mason. Michael raised his hands up. And all of them in reply stopped working for a few minutes. Science filled the room. Then the sound of gunshots and explosions <laughs> distance took its place. Daryl listened. He could hear the men screaming in fear <sighs> and horror. <laughs> That's the FEMA camp for you, said Michael. You get there and wait until the shelters can hold back no more. Then you die. That's just indirect mass slaughter all those people in once placed too much of an attraction for those machines said michael as he moved towards daryl so how have you been keeping safe asked mason <sighs> well we formed a group called the resistance answered michael hmm. we've been moving from town to town getting what we can from the rubble and recruiting men along the way we can do more with men like you in our ranks, said Michael, beckoning on Daryl and Mason. And approximately how many of you are there? Daryl pressed for more uh, information. Uh, a few dozen, for now. Everywhere we go, someone joins us. Michael walked towards the other men who were putting supplies into crates. Have you been Have successful, you, you know, at defeating these things? Daryl paced just behind the man. Barely. The man stopped to look back at Daryl and Mason. They're tough to beat, but not impossible. Daryl gave it a hmm. thought for a minute. He knew sooner or later they would have to give up the woods, but he didn't feel like teaming up with a few rogue citizens hmm. was the way to go. He felt it was too risky and that it could put them in trouble with the military. Well, thanks for the invitation, but I would have to decline said Daryl after a few minutes. I have a wife and a daughter, and that would just be too risky for them. Well, Michael looked a little bit dis disappointed. He walked back towards one of the wooden crates as they were using to store supplies and sat on it. You really aren't with left with the bulk of options, you know. This could be better than any other thing in the government is all, said Michael. Hmm. Daryl's ear, ear tingled at the mention of what the government was offering. He wanted to know more about that. And what is the government offering? asked Daryl. Well, the government has got two plans. They're trying to work out, said Michael with little no zest in his voice. You could tell he had given up on the government already. The first is some, some, some scientific project they have been working on for a while. It's called cryogenics. They plan to freeze some people for years. They hope to freeze mostly children. And about a hundred adults who would act as chaperones for the kids. The project is currently ongoing here in Richmond. Here? In Richmond? Daryl asked. A little bit puzzled why such an important project would be going on in a town such as, well, this. Due to the destruction of the university where the professor was working, the project is transferred to Richmond, which is considered one of the most safest FEMA camps, answered Michael. Daryl thought about this option for a bit. <laughs> what are the requirements for this freezing stuff? The Chosen. They're called 
called would have been to pass through the series of mental and physical tests, said Michael, slipping from the bottle. Daryl was certain Nadia could get through all this cryo deal, but he wasn't up for splitting up the family. All right, so what's the other available option? Daryl asked. The Resolute, answered Michael with less zest and passion than before. What's the Resolute? asked Mason. You must have heard rumors through living in a thrill of living in space. Well, the government was secretly working on it all these years, building a ship that is large enough to accommodate a few thousand people. The ship is called the Resolute. They have worked uh, with the United Nations, ensuring that every country participates in one way or the other. The ship can only take about 200 people from every nation. Daryl felt his sound, this sounded better. He could keep his family together in the process. So how do we get to this ship? You would have to get to Area 51 in Nevada. Oh, that's pretty far, exclaimed Mason. Michael continued this regarding the interruption. You should have, you should, you would have to get to some smaller spacecraft, which will take you to the Resolute. These little crafts can only take a few hundred at a time. These ships are called Jupiter. Right now, very few people know about the option. But what is spreading gradually? Well, that's a surer bet than all of this, said Daryl to Mason in a whisper. Well, thank you for the information, Mr. Michael. I think the Resolute is the way to go. Daryl extended a handshake to Michael, who grabbed it firmly. Good luck, Daryl. And you too, Mr. Mason. You guys will need, be needing a lot of it. Daryl turned around to leave. He had gotten to the door when he noticed Mason wasn't following. Come on, man. Let's get back to the girls, said Daryl. Mason stood still. Oh, sorry. Fist clenched deep in thought. He turned around to face Daryl. A trip to Nevada in such conditions would be too stressful for me at this age. Going with you would make me more of a liability. I think it would. I would rather stay back here, you know, and... Do what I know best. Fight. Michael's face brightened up at the sound of that, and so did the face of the other men. They were grunt they were getting a new recruit. Daryl's face didn't look too bright at all. What's come over you, man? Come on. The girls would love to have you come along. Your family. Man, please. Daryl spoke with tears welling in his eyes. I want to stay, Daryl. Please, said Mason trying to hold back tears, too. Daryl gave him a big hug. If, if we can't make it to the ships, we'll, we'll be back for you, I promise, said Daryl. Goodbye, friend. Daryl turned and walked towards the woods without looking back. His heart was set on Nevada. He was determined to keep his family safe, whatever the cost. That was the end of Chapter 5. Yeah. Now, we will read. Chapter 6, Area 51 Daryl kicked the tires of the car, cursing and swearing. Fuck, fuck, fuck! He picked up the plastic gas tank and shook it once more, as if checking it a second time would make it magically fill up. They were out of gas, again, and in the middle of nowhere. They had been traveling for about two weeks now. They were getting closer to Nevada. It was already winter. The snow and the cold made it very difficult to continue the journey. It was getting dark already. Daryl went to the girls to announce their obvious predicament. <clears throat> well, we're out of gas, again, and there seems to be no gas stations close by. We will have to spend the night here and continue moving tomorrow morning. As they prepared to sleep, Nadia asked a question. If, if there's no gas, that, that means we'll be walking tomorrow, right? She looked to Daryl for an answer. Oh, sorry. It's okay. She looked to Daryl for an answer. Daryl looked at Sam. He could tell she was scared and worried. Who wouldn't be such terrible, such terrible condition? Well, we may have to, to walk here, sweetheart, but don't worry. We are very close already, said Sam, bawling, bailing her husband out. Ooh, thank you. All right, then, said Nadia. 
it would be just like the camps. With that, she drifted gradually off to sleep. Daryl and Sam looking closely at her as she slept. She was all they had in the world. They were ready to protect her and give their lives for her if needed. Sam closed her eyes and tried to find sleep. After a while, she reopened them and turned to Daryl. He had been staring at her all along. Do you think we'll be able to get on those ships? Very few people know about it. Besides, many are scared to take such a long journey. That explains why we met none of those devils along the way. There will be space for us. I'm certain of it, said Daryl, reassuring his wife. That seemed to sat fully satisfy her. In a few minutes, she closed her eyes and found sleep. Only Daryl was left hunting for sleep. After hours of wriggling and thinking and th turning, Daryl was finally able to doze off. Deep inside, Samantha was filled with fear. Not for herself, but for her child. Nadia was her only child. Daryl and Samantha had unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully tried to start a family for so long before having Nadia. Even while doctors would tell her she wouldn't be able to conceive, she never lost hope. Then one day, in a miracle defying anything, the doctors had said she, would, she was pregnant with Nadia. From the beginning, Nadia was her little sign of hope and her light that kept her going every day. She was a survivor, just as Nadia was. But it wasn't long before it was morning. Sam tapped Daryl to wake him. He opened his eyes. Oh, it's morning? Ugh, then we best get going. Daryl got down from the car. It was still freezing. He went to the trunk of the car to get some things that they would need. Sam woke Nadia up and helped her get ready. As she brushed Nadia's hair, she could feel the fear in her heart, but she had to stay strong for her daughter. She beamed a smile at Nadia, who was looking rather worried and unhappy. Don't worry, baby. We will get on one of those ships, and all of their troubles will be long gone before you know it, said Sam, trying to cheer her daughter up. Nadia smiled a little. That was okay for Sam who wasn't used to seeing her daughter on the road. As they got down to start moving, they saw some flashes of light in the distance. It's a car! screamed Nadia excitedly. Daryl raised his hands up to flag down the car. He prayed it would stop. He didn't want his little girl disappointed. The car came to a gradual halt in front of them. Daryl went over to speak to the driver. To, to his utmost surprise, it was Bud. It was one of the men at Tranquil Lake. Hi, Officer Daryl, I believe. Yes, it's good to see you too, Bud, said Daryl in an excited tone. Bud looked out through the window and saw Sam and Nadia. Are they yours? He asked. Yes, this is my family, said Daryl. Then what are y'all waiting for? Come on, come on, get on inside the car, said Bud. Nadia jumped all the way to the car while all the other adults laughed at her gestures. Sam and Daryl got in and soon they were on their way. I believe you're on your way to Area 51, am I right? Asked Bud. Yeah, we are, said Daryl rather surprised. Well, I'm headed there too, said Bud looking very optimistic. I would really love to be out in space, even if it's the last thing I do. Daryl looked back at Sam. He just hoped that he was think what he was thinking wasn't true. They had to wait to get to Nevada first. As they drove on, they talked about a lot of things that had befallen them since the GDI attacks. About after an hour or two, Sam and Nadia were asleep. Bud looked back at them. I bet it's been so long since you've seen them sleep so peacefully, he said. True, said Daryl. I just hope this Nevada plan works out, you know. We all hope it does, said Bud as he kept on driving. Suddenly, they heard choppers overhead. I think we're here, Bud said a little excited. You wake up the girls. We're already up, said Sam. No one can sleep through that. Bud smiled and drove on as they got closer to the gates. Daryl's eyes popped at what he saw. There were so many people at the gate trying to get inside. The gates were being guarded by the band of soldiers who were screaming out orders and shouting at the people to step away. Oh my god, 
Sam exclaimed. There is no way we're getting past that crowd. Daryl got out of the car and climbed on top of it. He wanted to see what was going inside the base. He thought that the Jupiters were being boarded. He could see people going in were well dressed. Like they were not experiencing the hardship and harshness everyone else was going through. Bud was overwhelmed. Bud was overwhelmed. I thought nobody knew about this project, he muttered. I thought the same too, said Daryl. We need to find out what's going on. Daryl got down from the car and walked towards the crowd. He tapped a man on the shoulder who turned around looking very hopeless. Unless you are rich, powerful, or you are an opponent, you are not getting in one of these ships. <gasps> the man laminate as he glanced at the rest of the crowd. They're leaving us here to die, he said. Daryl held Nadia and Samantha. He couldn't believe they had made the long trip for nothing. Daryl peeped through the gates and saw a figure walking towards Jupiter, guarded by a group of soldiers, a man he recognized, and he was sure many did, there did too. He was a heavy set man with tan skin that had a glow of, an, of orange. His blonde hair was light, short, and waved in the breeze. It was the president. Just before he boarded the ship, he turned and waved at the crowd, shouting. Everything is perfect and getting better. We're doing a great job working on this whole thing and doing really good things. You'll see. Really good things. Don't listen to the fake news. There is no virus or killer robots. This whole thing was made up by a few sto stoner writers and some special effects guys. Horrible people. Burnouts. Very sad. They probably write weird stuff and make weird video games. Don't believe them. We're going to be doing really wonderful things really soon. With that, he waved one last time at the crowd, most of whom were shouting obscene words and names at him and his wife and then boarded one of the ships. The President Jupiter was the first to take off. As it rose into the air, the crowd fell silent, watching as it extended and and the glowing streak came out shooting towards it like a laser ball, striking it in the side. And a mushroom-like ball of flame blossomed out from the opposite side of the ship. A moment later, the upper half of the ship exploded off and went spinning sideways like a flaming disc. At the same time, another missile came rocketing toward the ship, even as it fell in flaming wreckage from the sky and struck it dead center, exploding it in half. The sound was thunderous, and flaming debris fell to the ground. The sound was thunderous as flaming debris fell to the ground, some landing on the military vehicles near the launch pass. The largest chunk of what had been the ship came crashing down right on top of it. Another Jupiter, just as it was lifting off, the sl and slammed into one of into the ground. A huge fireball blossomed into the sky, shocked the people turned around. Their fears were right. It was the GDI robots. They're coming fast towards the ba base, led by some titans, one of the deadliest of robots. All hell broke loose as the people started running in different directions, and soldiers holding up, holding onto the gates let them go, and the people started running towards the Jupiters too. Daryl and Bud, along with the girls, ran towards some shelter. Bud carried Nadia while Daryl held and Sam as they ran towards the building. One of the titans shot at the building turned into a massive flaming ball of orange and yellow flames before crumbling onto itself. Daryl lost his grip of Sam before he could gain his balance. Another explosion rocked the building. Shake, taking everything one and everything down with it. The blast hit him like a massive, invisible, massive, invisible fist, and he was thrown off his feet, flew backwards, and slammed down hard onto his back, knocked out. It was totally quiet for a while. Then there was awakened by the voice of Nadia. He stood up and haste. Nadia, Nadia, where are you? Dad came the scared reply of the distance from away. He followed the voice and discovered she was trapped in some small part of the wreckage. He removed the stones, praying nothing had happened to her. 
when he freed up the space, what he saw made him cry. <laughs> but had acted as a human shield for his little girl, making sure nothing happened to her. She was unhurt, but but Bud was dead. He pulled her out of the wreckage, crying. Thank you, Bud. Thank you very much, said Daryl. Are you okay, Nadia? Yes, yes, I, I am. Where, where's Mom? It was then that Daryl yeah. discovered he hadn't seen Sam yet. Sam? Sam? He cried out, running through the rubble. Nadia followed behind, screaming. Mom! Sam! Mom! Sam! Mom! After about 30 minutes of searching, he saw a hand he knew so well. A hand he had touched and held so many times. A hand which Daryl's matching wedding ring on the finger. He stopped and gasped in horror. <gasps> Nadia came from behind him and saw her mom, too. Mom, no! She screamed as she instantly began to cry. <laughs> Daryl held back his tears as he hurried to remove the stones and debris from his wife. Finally clearing her body free, he pulled her up and embraced her. Sam, he whispered as he cried, hoping for a reply. Sam, wake up. Please, wake up. Daryl pleaded with tears in his eyes. Mom, came Nadia's little voice. She couldn't come to terms with it. She couldn't understand what, what people were dying. But not her mom. She just sat on the floor crying. <laughs> Daryl held on to Sam's cold body weeping until the night came. And the winter cold swooped in. Sam was gone. The end of chapter six yeah. <laughs> we're sorry to leave y'all on such a sad note but we'll be back we'll be back next week with chapter seven yeah. and eight i know this has been an emotional ride but hopefully you had some tissues <sighs> hopefully because you're definitely needed them by now for show we'll be back yeah. see y'all in the next one